Welcome to the 4D Talks, a series of brainstorm sessions with people who perceive architecture beyond the three dimensions. The goal of these meetings is to discuss what this fourth dimension of architecture can be and how much it can impact the built environment and the uses of the space. Architecture can be described in many ways, for instance, through images, numbers, and words. However, what truly defines it is its story. With a very careful storytelling, we either win a competition or not, gain a client or lose one. This is why I propose today to consider stories as the fourth dimension of architecture, as something we can even design along the three dimensions. And I'm really excited to discuss this topic with my guest today, Juliette Mitchell, founder of Archetypo, the writing consultancy for architects. Thank you so much, Juliette, for uh, joining me today. Pleasure. Very good to be here with you. So as I, as I mentioned, it seems like we as architects, we often talk about architecture either in a very sort of over sophisticated way, or we just talk in numbers and amounts of toilets. So I think it's very clear that we need you to help us write uh, stories and learn how to do storytelling itself. But I'm also curious to hear why did you choose architects as your main target group and why you actually like writing with them and how it, how it started? Well, my background is in publishing. So I worked with writers for a long time, writers who were um, you know, writing for a living, writing for their creative happiness. It was all about the writing. And from there, I started working with people who just had to write things. So people who were doing other jobs and just had to write things as part of their jobs. And I realized what a, how I could make a real difference to them by just these very simple ways, things they'd never thought about, about how you actually need to communicate with people, how you can get your ideas across, how you can make something, allow someone to stand in your shoes, if that's what you're trying to do. So... I really enjoyed working with people who weren't writers. And at that point I thought, okay, this is going to be the main thing that I do. And architect, I was already, I was interested in architecture and I realized that architects actually needed a lot of help with this. So it felt a very natural thing to then decide, okay, I'm going to focus on architects. I think architects are amazing. You know, the way that you, and so Magda, you're an architect, so I can include you in this, um, that you have the technical side and you have the artistic creative side and you marry those together. And so I'm slightly in awe of that ability to do it. But I also think that architects, are so in, uh, sort of involved in their own design processes that they forget how we as non-architects, and it's important to me that I'm a non-architect, that I don't have that seven years training or however long it is in different countries, um, that I come to it very fresh. I come to it like a potential client trying to, uh, you know, seeing it from the outside. And I realised that a lot of architects, when they're talking to clients, for example, they're not seeing it from they're, they're not standing in their client's shoes, they're standing in their own shoes. And story is a way, for, you know, it's one of the, it, I have many tools to help architects uh, write and communicate better, but one of the big ones is story. And thinking about the fourth dimension, you know, story is a fourth dimension in, in the world in general, as in, you know, everything, the way that we make sense of the world is through story. The, may, the way that we turn random facts into something meaningful is story. Um, the way that we start to care about something is through story. The way we identify with other people is through story. And so it's just, it's crucial. And it actually, as human beings, we do it anyway, you know, from when we're small, that's what we want. We want to hear stories. When we're older, we keep using stories. In our personal lives, we tell stories all the time. But then as soon as we're in our professional life, we forget. We think, okay, I've got all this knowledge. It's the curse of knowledge that we have so much knowledge that we forget to see that actually how other people will interpret what we do is through wonderful things like stories that allow them to um, to stand in those shoes and to understand something. So um, that's why I'm sort of trying to bring more story into architecture. I'm not the only person who's doing that. You know, I have wonderful colleagues who are also thinking a lot about story and architecture. Um, and I think in the business world as well, you know, more generally, there is a lot of talk about stories. So it's what's wonderful is there is a, a kind of zeitgeist of this is the time that, you know, we need to make get everyone understanding story. Um, 
it's very difficult to plough a lonely furrow. If, you know, if I was the only person in the world saying, story, story, we all need to tell more stories, I wouldn't get very far. But I feel there's a, a current and I'm part of that current talking about stories. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can see the change happening these days already with like architects being invited to the TED Talks, for example. Yeah. But in the profession itself, it still seems like when we're talking about architecture, we say architecture description or design description. So what's the what's the difference here? Well, so this is this is um, fascinating, Magda, and thank you for bringing that up. So that was one of my the first things I noticed when I started working with architects and um, started looking at so many architects websites that they talk about project descriptions. Now, what's more interesting, a description or a story? Of course, it's a story. So the fact that they were writing with this idea of, oh, I need to write a description of the project rather than a story of the project, it starts you off on the wrong foot. And then you start to describe what the images can do better. And an important thing to talk about here is that actually, uh, you know, images, photos, um, drawings, are fantastic. Um, words are fantastic, but they have different strengths. So, you know, if you if you want to show the design, of course, you're going to use an, Im an image, a photograph. But if you want to show the thought processes behind the design and where the design led you to, or where, the, you know, what the design did for the, the um, or the human story behind the design, you need words. And it was as if, because they were calling it project description, architects were always thinking, oh, I need to describe the building. But actually, words can't do that as well as a photo. So let the photo do that work. Or, you know, all the photographs that you've got, all the, the floor plans, whatever. Um, and the thing to remember is that um, clients generally, not all, but a lot of clients are not fluent in floor plans in the way that architects are. So it's like you need to give them another way in. So that's where we, you know, we need words for that. Drawings can't, uh, drawings and photographs can't do that. So I'm, a, I'm everyone as a first step calling their project descriptions or getting rid of that, not project description, project story. And then if I can sort of go on from that into talking about how you then write the story is, so there's a lot written about, you know, how stories are constructed, what the narrative are. So stories are a kind of universal thing that have a very clear path. And I talk about stories as just having a beginning, a middle and an end. When you've got your beginning, middle and end, you then think, okay, it's going to be why, how and what. So that and that tell that is going to be the the path you your thread for your story about your project and the why is the inspiration behind it that that you know what led to that project what what the clients wanted what you wanted out of the the um, out of the project and then the the how is kind of the challenge of the project and how you overcame it and an important thing here is you're not trying to talk about every challenge you know that would. If you try and put too much in, then you lose the thread. So pick your challenges carefully, even have just one challenge and how you overcame it. And that's your chance to talk about your skills and your knowledge as an architect. And then the last thing is the the what, which is the impact, what what's what the result is um, and how it, uh, you know, what what it's done for the client. And that gives you the sort of the, the happy ending, the the, um, the the better place that the client has got to. And coming back to project descriptions, what I've often found is that um, an architect will finish their project description with a little detail about the balustrade, for example, or about the um, the material on the walls or something. And it's like, no, that doesn't give us the ending we want. We want um, an end that's going to make us feel good, that's going to give us that sense of, uh, um, of yeah, being in a better place. So just beginning, middle and end, why, how, what, and you've got your story. And I can also uh, imagine that in each of these three phases of these three parts of the story, yeah, you can also make mistakes by using words that are, I think there, are, there is a list of words that architects enjoy using and definitely overusing them. Like, you know, words that sound big, but in the end are very vague, like multidisciplinary, yes. right? Or absolutely. Absolutely. So there are so many words that are useful and you know as architects when you're talking to each other of course you're going to use words you, you use them because they they get to the point really quickly and you know it speeds things up when you're with your profession but for clients for example 
or you know if we're talking about a big community project where you're thinking about all the people who are going to be using it so clients or the, say the end users i've never liked the word end users so people who will use the who will be enjoying the building they um, they need the scenic route they need you to talk them through the the wonderful side of it they don't want to cut they don't want a word that misses all that out so you need to you know take them on that scenic group make them part of the emotional journey of it um i mean there are lots of other words that architects and people generally who are in their sort of professional heads that they use um for example when people are writing their bios their little descriptions of themselves on a on a website they'll they'll say prior to joining da, 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 whichever practice it is and it's like when we speak we don't say prior to we say before so obviously i'm talking about the english language but i imagine that this is true in so many languages that there are words that we tend to sort of use as a crutch when we're writing because it makes us feel like we're saying something serious but actually it sort of puts a distance between you and the reader so you know instead of using prior to just say before instead of using facilitate just say help instead of using commence just say start and um you know you'll be communicating so much better with with the people you want to communicate with yeah and i think it's also bringing the role of architects back so for me it's always been about sort of public function you know that it's we are there to also just create shelters for people experiences for people but uh, yes. i will uh, like to tackle upon a little bit later i also wanted to yeah. ask you about sometimes we seem to undersell projects in the way we talk about them as that's why we actually need you but i'm also wondering if there is a risk here to oversell them with the stories because i think with the selection of arts you can really stimulate people's Im imagination yes. and i think with uh, what we did as architects with visualizations we made them so beautiful for example you know when we give a render of like forest on a very thin concrete terrace and then it turns out that in reality we're going to be able to put just a couple of plant pots yeah is there also this kind of risk in storytelling um i think it's less so in storytelling because there's sort of more room for imagination so what you're doing in telling a story is kind of allowing people to imagine it for themselves um i mean you're you are empowering it you're supercharging a project in a way so if i give you one example which i is um in the uk um this is quite a while ago there was a brilliant building for schools program and um sadly it's not not going on anymore but it, it you know to sort of happier uh, more um, optimistic time a lot of money was put into building schools and it was the way that you know the story was not about just building schools it was about transforming education transforming the lives of young people that is you know that's the fourth dimension that's chain you know you're not just doing bricks and mortar you're not just going around making these buildings slightly better you've got a vision and i think we all need that vision you know without that vision everything just becomes about today well, i mean today's great you know i'm all for living in the moment but you know we need that vision to inspire people to inspire our teams to inspire our clients to make everyone sort of aim higher um mm -hmm. so I actually, I have a very good example of this way of thinking about designing and architecture. Um, and I think maybe that's also the way to avoid sometimes oversetting things. Um, it's also maybe by giving people different scenarios with the story we're telling. But what I mean by that is we also can use actually images to help us tell the story. Yes. And what I've, I've done it in, a, in an office in the Netherlands. Um, we were at that point designing a, a concert hall right. uh, called Amare. It's in the, in the Netherlands, in The Hague. And I remember we designed this little hall. It was more like a corridor sort of space. But the message we tried to convey here was that you can really do a lot of things with this space. And I remember making like five scenarios of this one space. And they were very, very specific. Like we, we did like a, a poetry evening, a cat walk, right. and a, like a jazz session or something. So these were also very, very specific things that people then remember much better. Yeah. And yeah. also it showed them that in the end, what we're giving you is an opportunity to do, to also write your own stories, right? And create Absolutely. your own. Yeah. So I, I love this idea of architecture being um, a background 
but yeah it's all about the people in the end it's all about kind of sparking their imaginations um yeah and I think there's something that I just mentioned uh, but I'll come back to um is about you know inspiring your team mm -hmm. I think you know especially big practices but small practices too anyone any practice that's more than one person uh, you need everyone to be sort of to the if you think about the story of the practice you know what a practice is trying to do the the purpose and the values and the the vision of the practice um you know that's a that's kind of the um it's a bit like the infrastructure the sort of the imaginative infrastructure of of what a practice is doing and you know that can't just be the director who's thinking about that it's got to be everyone and you you know well, I feel that having a purpose is really important for a, for a practice, but it's not enough to just have it on a document as, you know, OK, this is our purpose. These are our values. This is our vision. That's not enough. You've got to turn it into a meaningful story that everyone can be a part of. And if you turn it into a story, it becomes something that that is so much easier for everyone to come on board with because they understand, OK, this is, you know, this is the position we're taking. This is how we're we're helping our clients having taken this position this is the journey we're then going on and this is the better place that the vision that the you know the place we're coming to with everything we do in the practice and if you make sure that everyone can can be a part of that story as well then you know everyone's going to be an advocate for it um in fact on um last tuesday i was at the riba for a conference called guerrilla tactics and um there was a wonderful architect called anna parker from intervention architecture a uk practice and she was talking about how she, basically with each of her team she they work out that person's superpower and how that superpower can supercharge the practice so that everyone is not only part of you know is not only helping tell that story but everyone Everyone's superpower, each person's superpower is almost driving the practice and for helping shape the practice. And I, I thought that was a wonderful way of, um, yeah, of making, empowering people. I'm not that keen on the word empowering, but I think that explains best what I mean. Um, it gives everyone a sense of, OK, I'm a part of the story of this practice. I help shape this practice. Um, I want to be an, a champion for this practice. Um, so yeah, it's not just about the directors, it's about everyone feeling that they're a part of it. Yeah, exactly. And I, it seems like it's still not that often the case. When you go to the architectural websites, sometimes you actually just see the picture of the bosses and there is such a big group of people behind them. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I know this from being an employee in the past, um, that you, if, if people believe in you, if your, your bosses believe in you, you become so much more exactly don't you so you need to be part of that story you, you can't just be a cog sitting at your desk churning out uh drawings of toilets or whatever you've been put to work on you have to feel that you've got a part in where you're going you know so if you're the one designing the toilets that those toilets are going to be part of something bigger we always need to think that everything we do is part of something bigger and you know stories are a great great way of making those toilets part of something bigger yeah because it is it actually is in reality. absolutely yeah i don't want to switch topics too much but i'm also very interested in the whole notion here of of subjectivity because with all the stories we're telling you make people feel different things sometimes with the selection of words you go you can actually tackle some like very intimate emotions right yes is this a good thing or is this something to avoid how do you see that? I, I think this is a good thing. So I'm, you know, I'm very happy for people to come to me and say, oh, no, I don't agree. You know, we have to take away subject subjectivity and make sure that we are very professional and distance. And by the way, you can be subjective and professional. There's nothing that stops you being both. Um, but I think, you know, the great thing about stories is that they do tap into our emotions and it's our emotions that in the end, you know, give us the power. So you know i think if you as an architect put emotion into what you're doing you're that's going to chime with your clients your clients are going to be able to come on board and and kind of um yeah be on the same wavelength as as you and be um be excited about something you know we all need to remember that it's emotion that big big decisions we often make them for emotional reasons so for example buying a house it's often 
an emotional decision. Oh, this feels like absolutely the right house. And then, of course, we have to justify, OK, the price is right. It's got three bedrooms and I need three bedrooms and it's got this and it's got a bit of outdoor space. And we go through all that and make sure that it ticks all the boxes. But we don't start by thinking, OK, this room is four metres by three, which is just right. So I can da da da. We start with that gut feeling of, oh, I want this. And then we back it up with those rational things. So, you know, emotions are the drivers in life. That's where the strength is. So I think subjectivity, you know, let's all allow ourselves to be subjective. We can't leave our real selves at the door and come in and just be a mind without a heart. We are both. And the heart actually with big things and architecture is a big thing. I think the heart is really important. Um, to give you one example of that, uh, which is actually also from uh, last Tuesday at Guerrilla Tactics um, at the RIBA, um, we had Tarek Merlin, talk, who's from a practice called Merlin and Fikes, talking about how when they put onto their website, onto the homepage of their website, um, that they were an LGBTQ plus practice. Um, that for them, it was a very brave thing to do just to sort of be out there with it. So they put that on the website. They said, you know, we love working with, some, I'm paraphrasing here, but we love working with people who share our values. And suddenly things changed for them. They were getting more and better clients, clients who aligned with them. And it was as if the clarity brought positivity and brought the right people to their door. And it's not that they wanted only LGBTQ plus clients. It's just that thing of, you know, being subjective, allowing yourself to be who you are, being, you know, taking that position and that being the start of good things. And there was another speaker on um, at Guerrilla Tactics, uh, Sam Goss from Barefoot Architects, who talked about how if you put good things out there, those good things come back at you. And I really like that idea as well, that it's like we need to be subjective. We need to be clear about who we are. And then, you know, those things will come back at us because people feel if you feel good about how you're being you, other people will feel good about how you're being you. So, yeah, I'm all for subjectivity. This is very, very true. From my experience, it really seems like architects try to stay away from any kind of you know, political decisions, cultural. We consider that being professional, where, like you're saying, in the end, what we're doing is doing things for people. So we cannot cut this trick yeah. at all. Yeah, and a, and a building is such an emotional experience. You know, and that's what you, as architects, that's what you want from a building. You want to make sure that it makes people feel good. You know, so in the end, that's what it comes down to. And, you know, how can we make buildings feel good for people if we're not even even allowing ourselves or you as architects to, to, to feel things and to put that into your architecture? So, yeah, I'm all for that. That's actually a good way now to switch the directions, because I think one thing is to translate architecture into stories. Yeah. But I think it's also an interesting aspect of it is to translate stories into architecture, starting with the, the beginning of every design that maybe in a process of, you know, creating this design brief for ourselves or with the clients, um, it would be also very important then to hear the client's stories. Yeah. So, and then try to translate those into forms. And I'm wondering if there could be a design method like that, where you instead of asking your clients uh, when you're trying to build a house for them, instead of asking how many bedrooms and bathrooms you need, you should maybe ask, how do you spend Sunday morning? You know? Absolutely. I think that's, that's crucial. And I, um, and I think architects are starting to do that much more to realize that it's all about the listening. And, and in fact, they t talk about it so much now that it's like kind of, a lot of architects say, oh, we listen, but actually we want to know more than that. We want to know, are you listening and are you managing to then help the client express those things? Because the client might not have thought about, yes, OK, that's this is what I do on Sunday morning. But what is it that's frustrating, for example, about how I spend my fun Sunday morning? So how could it be better? To give you an example of that, I had um, uh, I was doing a little mentoring session with an architect uh, recently who was sort of struggling to uh, kind of find a way of talking about how he helps his clients. And, you know, I was asking, well, what is it your clients want? And he was saying, oh, they, they so we were talking about a particular project. He was saying, oh, they just want um, just wanted a bigger space. They wanted it to be more open. And in the end, we got to the, the point that what actually was frustrating the client was that he he couldn't eat in his kitchen. And I thought that was a lovely example of a, like 
you know, that might not come out straight away, but as architects, you need to find ways of kind of making it really specific, these things. So it's not just, oh, and then you get to the point of sort of starting to develop the design that's all about being able to eat sociably, you know, take down those barriers. And it becomes a much more meaningful conversation for the client as well, because suddenly they can sort of see, ah, this is what the design is going to do for me. So yeah, I think um, that stage of helping a client articulate their own frustrations, and then from those frustrations moving to the solutions um, is really important. I think it's sort of taking a role of, you know, a, a psychologist for a second. And I mean, as we said, we are already so multidisciplinary and that um, maybe it's just about choosing the right disciplines that we really want to focus on and going more into this, um, yeah, actually listening to people's feelings and experiences and trying to then translate that with our tools that we also have into built environment. Maybe that's... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, talking about this word multidisciplinary, which you've come back to. So I've, it is a word I struggle with. Um, I think I struggle with it because, um, you know, a lot of architects practice profiles seem to start. We are a multidisciplinary award winning practice. And I'm thinking, oh, as a potential client, I don't want I, I want to know that you can do this and this and this for me and that you'll bring this skill and this skill. I don't want to know that you can you'll do everything. You know, we all start from a point of view of ourselves, as in, you know, when we land on a website we're thinking what's in it for me we're not thinking oh i'm really interested in these architects what we're thinking is i'm interested in me and how that architect can help me so we as architects you need to flip it round and put that me that client at the center of it not not your own me of yourself the architect um yeah because it's it's their story it's not your story um or you know it's, it, they have to be at the heart of it and your role in that story is how you help them yeah, exactly. I think we're also doing it because we try to cover as much as possible, where in reality, if we're not specific enough, we're not really, like we're trying to please everyone, but in the end... You're trying to please everybody. So this is, um, the, I mean, this is the, the heart of being generic, is trying to please everybody. And, you know, you'll see practice profiles that talk about, you know, we're multidisciplinary, award-winning, we work on commercial, residential, da, 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 and all this, and we work at all scales and all budgets, da, da. and no one is going to read that practice profile and think, oh, these are the architects for me. They're not going to think, oh, I really want to work with these people, I trust these people. But if you can make eye contact, and figurative eye contact through your practice profile with the right clients, you know, even if it's just a few of them, that's all you need. You need the right clients. You don't need everyone out there. Um, so, you know, be specific, be clear. And someone, you know, the right client will read that and think, ah, oh, these are the architects for me. I want to work with these people. And really that's the point of your website is to make people want, make the right people want to work with you. Um, and if you put off the wrong people, that's fine. You know, who wants to work with the wrong people? Much better to filter them out right away than start that conversation and then work out, that actually, these people have got completely different values from me and want a project that I'm not interested in doing. You know, weed them out by being clear on your website about who you want, uh, who you want to work with and what you want to do. And you'll get rid of those, those wrong clients straight away. I think that's really a great lesson for architects listening here, hopefully. Um, yes. And so you know, on one hand, try to make architecture more human, more uh, focused on, on the experience that we're creating, uh, bringing it really back to people. And I think with that, we could also actually raise the importance of the profession itself. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you asked me at the beginning, oh, why, why um, did I start doing what I was doing or something like that? And, you know, uh, what I didn't say then and what I want to say now is that I think architects need to become so much better at spreading the word about what they do. I think it's different in different countries, but certainly in the UK, you know, a lot of people don't realise they how much an architect could bring to them. So architects need to become better at championing their own profession and at, you know, getting through to potential clients that, yes, we could really help. Um, so, yes. Because yeah, I think we, I really still believe that this is what we are doing. But then on the other hand, I would also, I think here, like to encourage all the non-architects to maybe look for stories in the buildings, to try to exercise this idea of yeah. going to a, a space and trying to maybe make their own story with it. Because that's also the dialogue. Absolutely, yeah. 
Um, oh, I think that's a lovely idea of, yeah, non-architects kind of seeing how a building can change people's lives and how it can take you from uh, from one place to a better place and how it, how it makes us feel and, and what that journey is. So absolutely, it's not just for architects to start telling stories about buildings. It's um, for everyone who's, you, you know, we all use buildings. We, you know, buildings are, are such a fundamental part of our lives that we all need to start seeing them as, um, you know, an influence on our lives. And that's going to, you know, drives us to making our buildings better because we realise how it does change how we feel and therefore what we can achieve and, you know, where, um, how our, you know, the trajectory of our lives. I really hope that with this, with this talk, we will encourage people to do that. Thank you so much, Juliet. Thank you, Magda. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. To avoid the fear of missing out, make sure you follow 4D Brainstorm here and on the other social media platforms like Instagram and LinkedIn. If you want to share your thoughts on this topic or would like to know how exactly this fourth dimension could be implemented in your design, just simply send an email to 4dbrainstorm at gmail.com. I'm really looking forward to exploring it further with you. Last but not least, if you're interested to know more about what I do, you can also check out the website for thebrainstorm.com, a platform for free brainstorming in all dimensions and fields. Join the brainstorm and let's discover the fourth dimension together. Till next time!